Okay, uh, yeah, because Ryan has seen this before. This is an introduction to Apache Cassandra. If you've never used it, seen it, uh, understood it, maybe you heard the rumors, saw some really cool slides from Apple, and you're like, is that a legitimate database? Is it? Well, I'm here to tell you it is. It's been around for a long time. Um, and it's crossed over the 10-year mark, which I think is a good mark. Um, it's a stable database. Um, it's getting where I'm going to be talking a little bit about Cassandra 4.0. 4.0 is uh, is more of a it's a milestone release for sure. It has a lot of a lot more. If you look at the features that are going to be released in 4.0, it's like a mature database release because it's not ooh these crazy features. It's like here's all these stability changes and developer productivity changes and. Um, more of that maturity level of a, of a long-term database that's being used at incredible scales everywhere. Um, you don't want to make big changes to things <laughs> when, you know, half of the world's commerce is running off of it. Um, <clears throat> and that's a true number. All right, so cloud applications, this is where everyone is writing their applications is for the cloud, right? And if you're not, it probably will eventually. But every cloud application has a basic need. And the kind of applications that we like to talk about, we are an application database, Cassandra. Um, Datastax, we're the experts in this, for sure. But any kind of uh, data that is close to or your users is the data that we want to talk to you about. It's not a back-end database. It's not a hadoop -y thing, a Sparky thing. It's an application database. Um, so things like IoT, financial data, gaming, some of the coolest projects I ever worked on were gaming projects, like Call of Duty, all that database behind that, Cassandra. Um, I got to go to a launch for Call of Duty. That was so freaking cool. <laughs> you know what I couldn't do? Play Call of Duty, because I didn't sign the right form. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so I have used every single, these are all the ones I've broken <laughs> uh, in production. Um, I've been called at 3 a.m. on most of those on the left. The ones on the right, I blame somebody else. Um, so, but this is, this is what the landscape is. And if you're on that left-hand side still today, that's still, these are still valid databases out there. I mean, or, those buildings still are there in Oracle land. Um, as a matter of fact, Oracle and Microsoft are big uh, sponsors of the DataStacks Accelerate Conference. <laughs> Go, guys. Uh, and IBM, too. That's kind of weird all of a sudden, I think about it. <laughs> Huh. Anyway, strange. it is a little strange. So, um, <laughs> what's that? And and you have more too. <laughs> well, I have a question. Who who are who's never used Cassandra? Who's here for the first time to learn about Cassandra? Nice <laughs> target audience. <laughs> so, I, what I'm telling you is new stuff. I don't feel like I'm repeating myself. This is great. Um, so, this is that. This is a very famous quote, which I, if you're using these older databases to do modern stuff. Um, I'm going to change this definition to this, <laughs> which is, um, you know, I, I, I spent years, I actually worked in this neighborhood in like 1998. I know back in the day, right? Dot coms are cool. We had tens of users out there. It was awesome. I made so much money off of getting an Oracle database to talk to a Java servlet. Everybody's like, you're a wizard. <laughs> no, <laughs> but that was, that was fun. But those databases then were great. Why? Because we only had a few, few users. Then Google and Facebook come along and blow it all out the window. So this is how I spent a lot of my first days trying to scale a large scale database is just break it into pieces and do this sharding routine. And um, my, this is probably an old joke now that Ryan knows this one. Friends don't let friends shard. That's bad. Because what happens when you do that? Because you're probably going to do something like this, where you, you break it up into, like, uh, into domains, like, oh, we're going to buy a customer name or something like that. And then what happens when you lose like, the primary, and then everything goes to hell in a handbasket? Everybody with a name that ends with N through T is going to be really pissed off at this point. And um, it's not a good way to sustain a business. <laughs> um, Twitter actually got over the hump. Remember the fail whale? Oh, see, the fail whale is like almost like ancient history now. But the fail whale, Twitter was down more than it was up. Actually, that was the fun part of using Twitter is finding out if it was online. <laughs> um, but the, you, know, you can't do that anymore. Um, apps go offline, people freak out, and they move on to the next one. 
Come on, keep going. All right, I'm, I'm killing this thing slowly. So in 20, 2005, and this is when I was working in infrastructure, I was running infrastructure for a, a SaaS company, um, we broke the internet. And why? Because we just couldn't rack enough servers. I was literally bringing in pallets of servers in these colos. We were doing Equinix down in San Jose. We couldn't put enough servers in there, and we couldn't buy enough bandwidth. And why? Because we started doing this stuff with, uh, man, this is really not working. Because of this, right? That these things are horrible. Because they just told the whole world that your experience, your online experience, is now 24/7. So now we expect. Remember, uh, maybe some of you probably never heard of this, but banks used to be open from nine o'clock in the morning till about three or four in the afternoon. That's the only time you could get your money. Can you imagine not being able to do banking on your phone at 3 a.m. in Europe? <laughs> I mean, it just changed everything. And so we broke the internet and everything is different. Now everything has to be online 24-7. Um, it has to be phone quality, meaning that whenever I go like this and, oh, click, it's there, it's available, ready to go, fast. Because when it isn't, things, bad things happen. So around that time is when the Dynamo paper came out, and this is one of those papers that is really, really cool. Look, I got a Voldemort quote on there. Do you see that? <laughs> we were talking about Voldemort. He works at LinkedIn. Voldemort, um, I'll get to that in a second. So the Dynamo paper was one of those, like, wow, this really is cool because here's how to do all these things, and it's about performance and reliability and keeping your data from going south. And uh, really what it came down to is Amazon, and I actually know a couple of people on this paper, um, Amazon was sick and tired of paying Oracle and not getting the reliability they needed. Uh, Jeff Bezos loves money. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> um, and this was to replace the shopping cart on Amazon because they couldn't keep it online long enough. Because you know how a relational database works. When you do an upgrade, you got to bring it down. And if you don't have a secondary over, it's a crime. Did you hear this? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, when, when you have a relational database that is in front of something mission critical, it's built in downtime. You, you can't avoid it. So using some computer science, how do we avoid downtime? Hard problem, but they did a really good job of describing how they work. Interesting enough, uh, they never built this. DynamoDB in Amazon is not from the Dynamo paper. They just co-opted the name. Funny, funny story. However, it started a revolution, or an evolution. Uh, React, which is another database that was very popular for a long time, had a very bad fallout. Uh, Voldemort, which we were laughing about it, uh, about LinkedIn. LinkedIn built this thing called Voldemort, um, all based on Dynamo, and then this little database called Cassandra. Um, Big Table was also a pretty influential paper in that time, and this was about how to get a data model that is closer to what we use in our applications. Long sequential forms of data, um, linear reads, that sort of thing. Cassandra came out a year later, um, and Avinash and Prashant both were on that original Dynamo paper that you saw. Um, Avinash is one of the funniest dudes you'll ever talk to. <laughs> he's a real, he's a character. Um, but the Cassandra, um, Cassandra was built at Facebook to replace their messenger, and the HBase team got ahead of him, and so he got all pissed off, <laughs> and he put it in the Apache project. There's only one Apache project that came from Facebook, and it was Cassandra, and he did it without telling anybody there. <laughs> so that's a fun story. You only, see, this is a San Francisco crowd. I gotta tell you these stories. I won't tell this is a Chicago story. No, Chicago will not get this story at all. <laughs> so um, it featured all these things about Dynamo, about uptime, but it took the big table data model and said, all right, we're going to glue these things together, and we're going to build this really robust database with a cool data model. Because Dynamo is key value. And if you've ever worked with a key value database, it's good for some things, really bad for most things. right? So this is a richer data model. So let's get into the basic architecture of Cassandra. So you, I, this is, <laughs> is in-the-weeds talk. We're going to put on our engineering hat and go. So we start out with this lonely node. A Cassandra node is just a server running a JVM process. Um, in this particular case, it's a single server. 
Now, no one, this is not how you deploy into production. A single node of Cassandra is either on your laptop or a boring database with very little features. So not what you want to do. But that's OK. I'm going to explain how this works. So a, a Cassandra server stores, a, uh, stores data locally. It's stored on disk. And that data is arranged in a way that uh, it's called a partition. And each node has a partition of data. Now, a partition is a 64-bit value. It's really big. Um, but in its, we use a consistent hashing algorithm to figure out where that data is partitioned. And if you're not familiar with consistent hashing algorithms, those are really great little tricks of computer science. When you input something, it always gives you the same output. So you put in a Shakespeare sonnet, you get a number. You put in that same Shakespeare sonnet, you get the exact same number. And it's really, it's, it's also kind of a compression thing, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but um, they were, they all, they're very similar to encryption hashes, but in this case, we use them for just always getting the same number out of one string. So we use that quite a bit to generate tokens. So each node owns a range of tokens. Now, in this case, there's just one node, so it owns all of them. We also do this thing, um, well, we have this beginning token, like that's what the token we assign to a node. That's the beginning of the range for that node. We have a thing called virtual nodes, which breaks down those, those uh, ranges into smaller chunks. That's more of an operations thing. You'll see how that can be very helpful later whenever we get into large clusters. It helps arrange the data in a better way. But these are kind of the basic terms of partitioning and tokens. So like I said, a single node of Cassandra is kind of boring. We want to build a cluster. Now, when I first start at my cluster with one node, not really a cluster, but sort of. It's, I'm going to have this imaginary range of 0 to 100, because I don't even know what that's called. But a 64-bit number is huge. You do not, we're not going to use that. We're going to use a more human number, like 0 to 100. So when you add a node to the cluster, it will, we split the, the token range in half. So one will be start at 0, one will start at 51. And now each one of these servers stores half of the data. So you see what we've done. We're, as we're splitting, we're forking out how much data is in there. And if I double it again, now each node is storing a quarter of the data. You can see how the token ranges are breaking it down. So when, we come, when it comes to linear scaling with storage and for reads and writes, the, the story with Cassandra is linear. When it has a linear read-write um, capability or capacity based on how you add nodes. So if you need double the capacity, you double the amount of nodes you need. And it makes it very good for planning. But this is something we could also do online, which is something I'll show you. All right, so we have this set up. But having four nodes, we each, each node has a quarter. We're right back to our sharding problem. You're like, dude, you didn't show me anything. That's sharding, yo. And true, <laughs> if you put four nodes out there and that's it, then good luck when that fourth node or third node goes down. You just lost a quarter of your data. The Replication is really the important part of this. This is, this is probably the most, there's two things that I'm going to show you that are the most important part of a Cassandra architecture. So the replication is, is this uh, concept of each node. I'm going to walk over here so I can point. So each node now is, stores a primary range, so like the 0 to 25. But this, this node right here also stores 76 to 100. It stores its neighbor's range. So now each node is storing half of the, of the data in the cluster. Now we're starting our, now we have more protection. If I lose a node, I'll probably be OK, but it doesn't give me the most protection. The most protection we like to see is a replication factor of three. Three is a magic number. That's a song, by the way. Um, three is a great number for replication because it's the right number for, like, that's a good uh, multiple of your data. But four or five, you start getting diminishing returns. It starts being too much replication, and you start losing money on how much. Uh, I mean, you don't get as much return on your safety. Um, there are some great academic papers on that, printed in LaTeX, as we talked earlier. If you would want to do an academic paper, you can only use LaTeX. You cannot use PowerPoint or what, what's the other thing? Uh, PDF? No. It has to look like an academic paper. <laughs> But there's some great academic papers that show that three is a good number. So all right, if we have three is a replication factor, each node now stores three sets of data, primary and two replicas. 
So that means each node now in this four node cluster is, has three quarters of the data. That means we can now lose two nodes and we still don't lose any data. Awesome. But replication comes with its counterpart, which is consistency. These are the two things you need to know. Replication and consistency. Replication is great because that means, oh, good, my data is all spread out nicely. As a developer, you probably want to know what level of, uh, if that replication actually happened. So if you write data into your, into your cluster, you want to know that it's there before you move on. And as a, as a programmer, you can specify that consistency level. So let's do that. So when the client says, I want to write to partition 15, that's kind of in between here. So it's right here, here, and here. It's going to write to that primary node and then out to this replicas. Okay, so this is an asynchronous copy that happens when it writes to, uh, I just happen to write to the primary. This write can happen to any node. Any node can act as a coordinator. That's what we call that. Um, because each node is participating in the cluster, it knows where all the data should be. So if I wrote to this node right here, it would know, oh, here's where the data should live. And it would asynchronously send that data over to the other nodes. But when I'm writing it out, I don't know what happened. So I'm going to specify when I do that read or write the consistency level. And we give, this is the tuning factor. And this is actually pretty cool for someone who's writing code, because you now have power. The, the least is what we call, a least consistency level is called one. And that just means that one replica acknowledges the write to disk or that it has the data. And that's it. So um, it acknowledges really quickly. And a one is the fastest because we're not waiting for other nodes to re return the data. So that is a really popular one because it's good for things like IoT. You're not losing data. You're just m moving data into the cluster as fast as possible. And the consistency guarantees you're not asking for. Yes, it still replicates the data. That does happen. But you're not asking for that to complete the transaction. Now, the strong consistency is a quorum. Quorum means that 51% of the replica nodes, I should probably change that to replica nodes, not just nodes, agree on a read or that they've committed to the disk. So in, when you have a replication factor of three, 51% is two. So two nodes need to say, yes, I either have, a, I, we agree on the data, or that we've written it to disk. And if you read and write at quorum, that's strong consistency. That means when you do a write, and then you come along and do a read, you'll read the same write. So you won't lose, you won't have stale data in that. Now, if you do a read at one, you have a potential of stale data. If you do a, a read right after a write, you might get lost your old data or no data at all. That's part of how this works. Now, we have this thing. This is just to give you some idea of another setting, the local quorum, because whenever we're running in multiple data centers, quorum could potentially cross a WAN line. And we'll get into how this works. This is actually one of the superhero tricks that um, Cassandra does is really good WAN replication. But the local quorum means I only want to get a, a quorum in my local data center. Why? Because a WAN link usually generates a lot more latency. So like if you're going east coast, west coast on Amazon, it's like 70 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds of, of hop time. Um, that, that means that when you do a quorum read, you have to wait that 60 or 70 milliseconds for it to do that. Uh, do a local quorum. You'll be happy. So now with consistency, what I'm saying is now as a client says, write to partition 15 with a seal of 1. I'm tagging that consistency level on. When it writes, it still writes to the one node. And uh, it writes to all three nodes. But the fastest node, like this one over here, let's say that it, uh, the coordinator, this node up here and this node right here, are having a bad day because somebody decided to gzip the entire data directory. You know who you are. <laughs> Because that happens, right, in production. This, so this node over here happens to be the fastest. Well, it returns a really fast, uh, really fast write. And, you know, in those cases, whenever I have it set, you know, I've, I've seen some ridiculously fast writes on these because it's the way that it writes. And I'll show you how it writes to the disk in a minute. But this is how you get that sub-millisecond write SLA. All right. So whenever. Man, that was a big boom. Was that an earthquake or me? 
Let's say we have this situation where <clears throat> somebody walks in the data center and unplugs a, a rack. <laughs> I may have done that at one point in my life. <laughs> and it takes down a certain group of servers. Well, back in the day when I was doing Oracle Rack, if I took down a, a rack of a literal rack of servers, I was not a popular person for another two hours when it resynced all the quorums. So this situation is totally cool in Cassandra land. If I have two nodes that go down, the client's going to write to the one node that's up and back up. And it'll be like, nothing happened. This is that magic moment. Oh, yeah, we do have an earthquake. Um, this is that magic moment where you're just so happy you're using Cassandra. And I've had this happen so many times where, oh, we're doing a, we have to do a, a database update on this one. Oops, I terminated that node by mistake. And no one knows the difference. That is a magic day. And we do things like this in the daytime, too. But this is, a, this is how you keep your customers happy. This is how you keep your app online. Is these things start going, <clears throat> you know, life happens, infrastructure fails, it can work around it. And what's great, and I'll point this out real quick, is so Datastacks, we build all the drivers for Cassandra and for Datastacks Enterprise. We put in all this resiliency inside of our drivers. Our drivers actually participate in the cluster and the gossip, so the what's happening in the cluster. So when things are happening in the cluster, our drivers are aware. There's no configuration file when it starts up. It isn't like, give me a list of all the nodes. Oh, no. As nodes are going up and down and disappearing and coming back, the drivers are updated in real time because they have this, they're participating in the cluster. So whenever you have a node go offline or two of them go offline and everybody knows it, the driver just works around it, and no one will know the difference. That's almost magic, but it's computer science. So what about a quorum? Same thing. We write to the cluster. Does asynchronous write? What if one of those nodes goes down? Totally fine. Because now we have two nodes. Let's remember, we need 51% to get that read back. Multi-data center. Like I said, this is the superpower of Cassandra. I do not understand why databases, modern databases don't do this. Amazon will not sell you a database that can do this. They sell things that will replicate. They don't think you cannot buy an active, active database from them. And I get why. It's hard and it's expensive and they, can't, they don't want to do it. But here's a very, do you see these across the top? Amazon, Google, Cloud. We have so many customers that are doing this now that are running in multiple clouds. It is really freaking cool. Um, we had a demo, uh, you guys know Sky TV in, in the UK? They run in Amazon, GCP, and on-prem. They have three different setups, one database across all of it. And <clears throat> it's because of the way that the, the database replicates. So when I say write to partition 15, it goes to the coordinator. Now, not only does it asynchronously copy into the local data center, it also asynchronously copies to another coordinator in another data center, in that other data center, or multiple data centers, and then it does the local async copy. So <clears throat> this is how you can run active-active. Not standby database. You know, that, that was back when I was doing it. It was like, oh, we have a standby data center, which means we're paying 100% of the price for something we're never using. That's sad. Um, there's some great talks online. If you, YouTube, uh, you go to YouTube and Google, uh, uh, do a search for Cassandra Multi Data Center or Cassandra Active Active. You'll see some great talks by Netflix and a couple others that talk about this. Um, but this is what we're trying to survive is both Amazon and Google are great at going down. You know, <laughs> they lose infrastructure so fast. And um, well, it's great because you only pay for it by the hour. So when it goes offline, you don't pay for it. But this stuff is what we're trying to avoid. All the things that happen, either it's a person, it's something at Amazon or Google that went down, it broke, or an entire cloud or an entire data center going down. If you are not running in this configuration, you have zero chance of 100% uptime. You need to be in multiple data centers. Data centers go down. Clouds go down. And usually not an entire cloud. It's like a region, right? A region goes down. Sure, lots of stuff happened. Nothing is invincible. We, have, we don't have vibranium data centers yet. <laughs> yet. Although I bet you when we find Wakanda, they will have the 100% uptime data center. 
because I, I just think that might happen. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about how to actually use a database. So this is how, that was how it worked. So relational databases, we all use them, we all loved them. It's all this, you know, the five normal forms. How many in here have actually used the fourth and fifth normal form? Stills none. Okay, Ryan. I had to build a database. So I, I, when I was in university, I was a computer engineering student at Cal Poly. We had to build a database that satisfied all five normal forms. It sucks so bad. <laughs> no one uses it. <laughs> anyway, it's all these normal forms. It's, de -nor it's normalizing your data, separating out the employees from department. I think this is a Scott Tiger database. Um, <clears throat> and you have foreign keys, and you, can I join you? <laughs> join, join jokes for SQL. And then this, the ERD, isn't this great? Do you feel a little pang of joy when you see this? Not really. Um, relational database modeling is this. You create a table, you add your constraints. This is an actual Oracle table. You index it, then you create a foreign key relationships oh, down here. Uh, so this is how you do relational database modeling. Um, and the, the method is you start with this domain of your data, you build the models for that domain, you create, create that ERD, print it on the big piece of paper and put it in your office, right? Everyone goes and looks at it and says, where's my data? Uh, and then you build your application. But what happens is you've got to know these to get to this, right? Because that's when you, like, oops, we missed our model. I'll just join my way out of it. <laughs> and then you impress your friends with your left inner join. <laughs> and everyone's like, dude, that's going to take like eight hours to run on the server. We shouldn't put that on the homepage. <laughs> so yeah, this is, but uh, relational databases were meant to be, two, they built on two concepts, which was um, keeping the amount of duplicate data to a minimum, because when, they were, when it was designed, uh, disk cost like a million dollars for a five meg database, or five meg disk drive. Um, and also, this maximum flexibility. So, when the data's in there, we could do millions and millions of different things with it. So many joins and all these things. And that was a different era. And uh, it has a lot of utility. It's called a data warehouse. I use them all the time. I think they're great. I have an SQL database running on my laptop. Why? Because I have data that I want to do a join. I want to do a data warehouse-y type discussion or type thing. I'm not building applications on it anymore. I'm using Cassandra. <laughs> and Cassandra does a different, it has a different methodology. You start with your application. So what am I going to build? Because it's an application database. What am I going to build? Then I build my models for that application, my data models, and then the data is underneath it. What does that give you? Less flexibility, so it's reverse of relational. It's less flexibility in your query models. Um, you will have duplicate data in your system. However, it's super hyper-optimized for your application, and it's going to be fast, and it's going to be resilient. You're, you're flipping the script. My application is the most important thing, not my data model. So let's get into it. Now, this is whenever everyone goes, <gasps> this looks like it's too hard. No, it's not. OK, modeling queries. How do you do this? Well, we have some basic rules. What are your application workflow? This is a very interesting concept. When you're building an application, you actually do know your workflows. And it's a part of building an application. A bonus, more whiteboarding. But, and then how will I access that data in my application? So this is the. Probably the hardest part of Cassandra is not, you know, if you don't know the queries ahead of time, it's very difficult to build a data model. I get it. But there is, once you get into the pace of this, you start seeing, well, it's like the matrix. You start seeing it. Uh, but there is a methodology to this. And we have a very formal methodology, too. And I'll show you. And yeah, this is, you can't just join your way out of a problem, right? <laughs> uh, or, hey, I'll just add some indexes and do a join, and we're good, right? No, you gotta, you gotta redo some things. But I'm gonna walk you through this, some of this process. So this is a application workflow. And this application workflow is as I'm designing this application. Now we have an example application online called Killer Video. K-I-L-L-R video. Why did we drop the E? Because I couldn't register the domain name otherwise. <laughs> um, but we have a, a reference application online. This is, a, and it's kind of like YouTube um, a little bit where we store, you know, you have videos online, people can comment on it, you can rate them, that sort of thing. But this is a standard application workflow. Like, the user's gonna log into the website, user and password, boom. Okay, once you go there, then you're gonna show the basic information for the user, or what videos they added, 
the comments that they have. And then over here we have a search for the video. You're gonna search, but once you find that video, then show the video in its details. So there's this flow of information that's happening. Um, I, I'm not going to just go directly to show basic information to the user. That has to happen first. But that makes sense, that's an application workflow. There's, this is a security violation. <laughs> if you don't provide a username and password, then this is what, like target? <laughs> Ooh, too soon? <laughs> My bad. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so now I'm looking at what those application workflows are and what queries I need to do. So if I have a user logged into a, into a site, I need to find that user by email address. That's probably how I'm gonna be looking them up. Um, show comments, I wanna find comments by that, uh, by the video, the name of the, or the UUID of the video. So already I'm starting to see my queries here coming out. And this is the, the process that I'm talking about is now I'm, I'm picking through like what I need and then here it is, here's what I get out of it. We use a, a query language called Cassandra query language, CQL instead of SQL. And CQL is uh, very, it's very similar in a lot of ways to SQL. However, it has a big difference. It doesn't do joins and has very limited aggregations. So in this case, I do a join for my employees and department. This denormalization stuff that you probably have already done with SQL, I remember doing this quite a bit on my Oracle databases. I would denormalize all, you know, denormalize the data to get faster queries, put them all, all the, and all of that means is I'm putting all my adjacent data into one table. So instead of having an employee and department table, I have department in with my employees. That select first name from employees where ID equals one, Looks like an SQL query, doesn't it? That's actually a CQL query. So now we're, we're crossing over. CQL is just a denormalized, is a denormalized access language. So I'm, this is using CQL, to, this is a table creation for Cassandra. It's a real table. It's not key value, it's a real table. And it includes a table name, some column names, some CQL types. What's different here is the, C, the CQL type does not require any sizing information. And why? Because data that's stored in a relational database is on a fixed data file, and that has allocations for all your different data sets. I mean, so if you have a varchar 250, it's gonna allocate that many bytes on the disk, so because it's a random access pattern. As you will see shortly, that's not how Cassandra works. So there's no need to, uh, to describe the size. What's the limit? Two gigs. Don't put two gigs in there. <laughs> that will blow up your application. If you try to stream, because that's a streaming operation, that's like a whole huge video file. All right, so it also includes a primary key. Same reason. This primary key designates the unique record, in this case, a video ID. And what we call that inside of that parenthesis is a partition key. That's all your terms. So we do it, when we do an insert, same thing, table name, fields, we have to include the partition key. That's the required part of this, and you'll see in a minute why. But, and then the rest of it is just values. Looks really familiar, right? So let's talk about partition keys, because in a data model, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain to you the most important part of a data model, which is the primary key. Partition keys are these things right here. Now, I probably picked the worst possible partition key, because I used a UUID. And you look like, man, how am I gonna make that? Well, just go with it for a minute. Um, I need to change this slide. But we use a, I used a UUID in this case, because this is actually a real application. But taking this UUID, which is a nasty number, running it through a murmur3 hash, murmur3 is our consistent hashing algorithm, it kicks out these tokens. These are just numerics, and um, it will always kick those out. So the consistent hash, of course, is it should be a 64-bit number, my bad. Uh, between two to the negative 60, two 64, doesn't matter. The point is, is that it will be a consistent number every time, and the chances of collision are astronomical. <laughs> I don't say impossible, nothing's impossible. <laughs> but you won't have collisions inside your database. Um, the select, okay, now I want my data. Looks pretty similar. Table name, fields, again, partition key is required. And this is where you get a little sideways on a, a CQL data model, is that now we're getting into some requirements that you didn't quite need in SQL land. Like you could just select off of any field, or you could just say select fields from table. You could do a select fields from table 
in CQL, except what it winds up doing is grabbing all of the data from the cluster. And you think a full table scan's bad? Try a full cluster scan. <laughs> um, that'll take a while. It'll probably time out anyway. Um, the partition key is really important in a select query. Let's dig into why. <clears throat> Let's dig into why. There we go. Oh, sorry. And here's an example of the data. There we go. Why is a partition key important in this case? Well, this partition key, as you see it, let's say you have a thousand node cluster. And those are in the wild. They exist a lot. A thousand node cluster is a lot of data spread out over a lot of nodes. Now, if I want to find this video ID, I do not want to scan that whole thing. That's, what, that's a spark job. That'll take a while. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if you remember, each one of these nodes has a token range. So if I put that partition key through the Murmur 3 hash and I get a token, then I know exactly where it is. And it's right there on that node. And it'll always be in that node. And that's the key, is with a thousand node cluster, that data is only in one place, plus it's two replicas. That's it. So if I have a thousand nodes, four nodes, doesn't matter. It's always going to be in the same place. Sequences. This is another one that's like, oh, I, I, can't, I have to have this. You've probably done this before, create sequence. So that's like creating an ID. Every time you say select into, create or select or insert into, and you create an auto ID. Those are great. They're supposed to be unique, although I've blown up sequences before. You need acid to make that work. Why? Because you can't have two things get the same number. It's a race condition you cannot manage. OK. So I'm not going to do this. What we do, in, and this is actually a distributed computing thing, not just Cassandra, is instead of uh, using IDs that are incremental or generated, um, we use these UUIDs. UUIDs are fantastic because they can be generated on the client. They're guaranteed to be unique somewhere in the universe. Um, generally, they're like a 128-bit number. That's most of the, how UUIDs work. They're, like I said, they're easily generated on the client, but they're also baked into like every bit of Java, Python, every programming language has a way to generate UUIDs. So now we have this dynamic table. And this is where, I, like I said, the primary key, I'm showing you the most important thing now. Partition key is the first value in a primary key. The second and every other value after is called a clustering column. And that clustering column is really important for ordering data and I'll show you how it works. So the primary key relationship. We have a partition key clustering column. On the disk, we're storing the data model, which is like the header for the record on disk. Remember Bigtable? I told you about Bigtable, which is this really large uh, sequential group of data. Well, the partition key is going to be the header of the record. The actual data that's stored on disk is going to be ordered by that clustering column. So this clustering column is uh, setting up this order of operations after the data model. Why is that important? Well, I'm co-locating my data on disk next to my partition key. So how does that look? Well, when I have a partition key in a cluster, what I'm really doing is I have all these partition keys are the same, but look at these clustering columns are all different. So I've created an already baked in order to my table based on the clustering column. So this is my order by built into the data model. So if I have multiple partition keys, multiple cluster columns, this is what a table actually looks like under the covers, is that I have a partition key and a clustering column, and then here's all my other columns. And this data, all of this data right here, is located on the same spot on the disk. This is located on the same spot on the disk. So in, just to finish up the data modeling thing, when you have multiple tables, the storage of that is what's called a key space. Key space in Cassandra is like a schema or a database <laughs> in some. But uh, key space, the only thing that really is important about a key space is it stores the replication information. So um, if I want this replicated across multiple data centers, I say replication factor three, or, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, replication factor three here. And I could say replication factor at a different of uh, two at a different data center, or it's zero if I don't want that copy that data copied over. So that's what the key space is good for. So controlling order. If I'm inserting data into my database like this, this is a time series database. Um, I'm look at what I've done here. I have my weather station, 
with year, month, day, and hour. So what I've done is I've created this very orderly table now of correct weather data. So now it's in time series data, a uh, time order. So I have my order by descending. But what if I want to flip that around? Now I have uh, my user videos, that I, what time I've added them. What that does is that gives me the ability to ask the database for the data, and I could say limit five, and I get the last five things that I did. It's really powerful. All right, come on. Oh yeah, yeah. So how does this work on the disk? And this is real quick primer on write path. So when I insert data into the system, it writes to the commit log. It actually writes to the disk before anything. So this is how. This is why it's durable. It's not an in-memory database. It then writes. It, so every write appends to the commit log, but it also writes to the mem table. Once it does the writes to the mem table, it sends an acknowledgement back to the client. The client's happy and moves on. So that data lists here and there. Eventually, what happens is the mem table flushes out to disk. Well, what it does is it flushes out this exact order that you built in your data model onto the disk. That means now that your data is in a sorted order on disk. So as it's building more SS tables, it's kicking out more SS tables, eventually what happens is we want to join those together. We do this thing called a compaction. It reads all the SS tables and writes out one long one but it orders the data properly given your data model. So now we're maintaining order and keeping your data nice and compact in using the data model you created. So kind of a last thing here is, is um, the storage model, just to kind of give you an idea of how it looks on the disk. Whenever I'm writing data, this is the weather station. Look at the times. They're all in order based on the header on disk. And whenever I add data to the system, it's going to append that record to that large partition. That's the part of that big table model. This gives us some really fast data access patterns. So the read path, pretty simple. It just reads the data from, it has to read all the data from the SS tables, true, but it sorts it in that mem table properly and then sends it back to the client. So that, that sort order is kept. So whenever I read my data, I get the partition key for locality that tells me where it is in the universe, like what node it is in the, in the cluster. I do that single seek on the disk. I do a sequential read. I pull it up into a table. This is what programmers want, rows and columns. Good to go. Done. Woo! All right. That was data modeling. We also have a really long course on DS220 on Academy for free. Um, you can see more of us. <laughs> but this is, uh, you've got enough to be dangerous at this point. So let me talk a little bit about Cassandra 4.0, and then we're going to talk about clustering algorithms, because that's why you're really here. Um, so Cassandra 4.0 is, is, when is it going to be released? Soon. <laughs> it's open source. Come on. <laughs> it's an Apache project. We, uh, when it's done-ish, uh, we're probably, probably like summer, fall, it'll be ready. Um, it's out there. You can go use it, but it's, not, it's in a code freeze right now. But there's still testing and changes going on. Um, this is a huge stability release. And 3.0 was a big change to the underlying data store. And 4.0 is, is kind of a, like they're paying off a bit of technical debt. We're getting rid of thrift, a few other things. But there's some big changes, like this asynchronous data mode communication. This is actually outdated. We now have not 20% faster. It's five times faster. <laughs> It's using Netty um, to do a lot of the communication. It's doing zero copies. This means that you can bring your nodes up faster when you're bringing new nodes into your cluster. Needless to say, a lot of this stuff came from Apple. Apple are, runs some of the biggest clusters in the world. And they are all about making it super efficient and fast. Um, there's some restart condition issues that we've had over the years. And it's getting a lot of that's getting cleaned up. Um, also, some stuff inside the slow query logs. Um, a slow or large query log, like something that's taking too long, you want to know. What if someone did do a full cluster scan? And it also has the ability to stop. If someone did, say, select star from, from table, go, it's going to run for a long time. Well, it'll stop those uh, big, long uh, cluster killers. The big features that are coming, and these are the features, not the stabilities, um, pluggable storage. Facebook, Instagram has been working on a lot of that. Um, they want to use it specifically for 
adding RocksDB as a storage engine underneath Cassandra. Um, but pluggable storage in general uh, is a database concept. Uh, that, that's a big contribution from Facebook. Um, audit logging, um, that's a contribution that's coming from Uber. And uh, this is for secure, like security compliance, like who's accessing my data. Virtual tables, this is the one that I've been waiting for for three or four years now. <laughs> and that's just creating um, tables that actually are under, it's not a materialized view. What it is is tables that show underlying operating statistics from the running database. So you can say select, you know, V dollar sign tables, for instance, from Oracle that show you underlying performance counters. That's what virtual tables are. And then finally, there's about six or seven <laughs> management sidecar proposals out right now. Um, but basically, it's an HTTP process that runs along with the nodes. So you can run things like repairs and things like that. Um, it gives you better ways you can manage the cluster. Uh, another thing which is really fascinating, and um, Datastax has been doing a lot of the lead on this, and there's some other uh, Cassandra community members working on this. And this is, this is pretty early, early statistics, but we're looking at some of the new garbage collection algorithms that are out there. Uh, one of which is really interesting is the ZGC. Um, and this, this is really interesting stuff. Um, we are getting like these, this is the, the public graph that I can show. <laughs> the stuff that I can't show is even more interesting because it's unbelievable, but we're still testing it. There's some gotchas though, it's very interesting. But what we're showing here is like these, these latency numbers, these P99 numbers of like a second or a millisecond, um, where you know, when we start looking at P99s for different style, like how many different readers and writers we have going on, it, you know, it starts degrading over time not with ZGC, it's just rock steady. And uh, when you look at read and write graphs, it's just a straight line. It's amazing. There's no fluctuation at all. So we're really excited about potentially not having to tune ZGC ever again. Um, like I said, there we found some problems because now that when you get rid of GC problems, you find new problems, right? You move one and get another. All right, that is me. Thank you very much. Any questions while we're switching laptops here? <laughs> Yay. Yay, thank you. <laughs>